Okay. So we're going to go ahead and get started with this. Um, we were talking about organic molecules the other day, um, things that have carbon-carbon bonds. And um, we talked about four macromolecules. I tried to hit carbohydrates and lipids both in the first week, but um, due to figuring out the virtual world, I think we're only going to hit carbohydrates. Um, so in your book, you should always be reading the pieces that we're doing. So in the flex time, I did put, make sure you read sections uh, 3, 1 through 3, 3. That takes you through organic molecules in general and carbohydrates. Um, you should always take notes, work in the workbook. Um, so those things I put in the Google Classroom as well as what I call a, it comes from a book and the book is Biozone. So there's four worksheets that go with the Biozone this time, um, catching up. There are two of them I should have given you when we did organic molecules in general, but I didn't. Um, and they're PDFs, and if I have time, I'll try to convert them during our downtime. Um, but you guys are getting so that you understand PDFs and do Cami or Lumen, and you do all right. Um, so most uh, abundant macromolecule on Earth is the carbohydrates. Any idea why that would be? How is it that we can say carbohydrates are the most abundant? What connections can we make to other biology knowledge that we have? Feel free to shout out or I'll open up my chat box. I always forget to open that. Can everybody hear me? Just one, okay. I like the thumbs up in the part of the, whatever they're called, reactions. Anthony, can you hear me now? I feel like um, that phone commercial. Okay, in the chat box or shout it out. What connections can we make to the fact that carbohydrates are the most abundant macromolecule on earth? Shout outs are good. Think of ecology. What do you know, what kind of, what kind of things are made up of carbohydrates? And where do those fall in the ecological world? So throughout the year, we don't wanna study something just all by itself. We want to study its connections to everything else. So if you think about the food web, right? And we have that food pyramid. And we know that um, the producers are at the bottom of the food chain and that pyramid of numbers, there's lots more um, carbohydrates, right? Because there's lots more plants. So that's how we're able to say they're the most macromolecule on earth. Um, so we're gonna learn a little bit more about them. Notice the H2O here. So the word carbohydrate yesterday I said literally is translated carbon, water. So it always comes in a one to two to one ratio. Like C6H12O6 is your um, saccharide. That's glucose. It could also be other um, monosaccharides. So yesterday we identified molecules that contained a two to one ratio, hydrogen to oxygen. Um, we want to know what we use them for, energy. So remember cellular respiration. This is a connection to that in the whole carbon cycle. Um, we take our glucose and we break it down and we make ATP in our mitochondria, if you remember all those things. We can store our extra energy. So what we, you know, we're taking in a lot more molecules um, than we're expending as far as energy goes, we're taking in more calories than we're expending. And so we store that. Um, for us, we store it in the form of glycogen. You can also use carbohydrates for structural materials, such as the plants. Um, we know their cell walls are made of um, carbohydrates. You have the exoskeletons of insects. You have um, chitin uh, is in the fungus, the mushrooms. So the basic monomer, we're gonna learn monomers and bonds that belong to each of the four macromolecules. They'll be different each one. Um, so the monomer of a carbohydrate is a saccharide. So when you see anything with that C S A C C, you can guess it has something to do with sugar, right? So they form chains and rings. So in solution, the carbon wraps back upon itself and it forms rings. So typically we have five and six carbon rings um, that we form in solution. So in biology, in the biology world, go ahead and put in the chat box or shout it out, where do we find solutions? Why would it be important to know that 
those sugar molecules are in rings in solution. Blood is a good choice, yep. Blood is a solution and we talk about blood glucose levels. So in our cytoplasm, right, also is solutions. Um, so inside of our cells, we have solutions. So it's important to know about each of these macromolecules in solution because that's how our body deals with them. So this is showing you the straight ring chain uh, or the straight chain. And remember, we talked about functional groups yesterday. There's all of our hydroxyl groups that you find on sugar. It makes it very polar, which means it likes water. Um, and then there's our carb Final group um, at the end makes it an aldehyde. Here it shows it wrapping back upon itself, right? So it can form rings in solution. We're going to be working with numbering of carbon atoms. Usually I have a worksheet for us to do on this one. I didn't do that. The carbonyl group right here, this is where you're going to start counting your carbon atoms. So you would refer to the hydroxyl on the fifth carbon in this case. Um, and when we have these rings, we're going to start counting again at that carbonyl group, which is usually after the O, the, the oxygen that is in the um, ring. So one, two, three, four, five, six is hanging off. So this is going to be important when we talk about nucleic acids because we're going to form bonds between the third carbon and the fifth carbon. Remember from DNA, we talked about the three prime and the five prime end, and that's what it's referring to, which carbon atom it's on. So here's your carbonyl group. I'm going to start numbering at the top, one through five, I think there is, six. Over here, here's my, um, the oxygen that forms the bond, and this is my carbonyl group. So a one, two, and I go around the clock like that. Um, so here's our carbohydrates. Monosaccharides are going to be our quick sugar. You can probably know that because you guys like take in simple sugars for quick energy. Um, glucose, for example, fructose. Um, disaccharides have two sugar molecules. So here's a monosaccharide, here's a di, and here's multiples. So the disaccharide example, sucrose, that's sugar cane, that's the sucrose. It's the sugar that you find on the table. And polysaccharides are mini saccharides. You might read about the oligosaccharide. Oligo is just a few. So they typically say three to five is a few. And that would make it an oligosaccharide. And we have oligosaccharides in our, um, in our cell membranes. So the mono and disaccharides are both sweet. So that's part of their characteristics. We're familiar with ribose and deoxyribose in their... Um, in the DNA and RNA. You're probably very familiar with glucose. It's the one we usually use when we're in a lab. Fructose is found in fruit and galactose. Some of you can handle and some of you can't. Sugars that's found in milk. Um, so these are gonna have at least two hydroxyls plus the aldehyde or ketone. So depending on the position of that double bond, here's an aldehyde, here's a ketone. So characteristics that uh, makes it sweet to taste, dissolves readily in water. Dissolving and dissociating are two different things, and I think I got a little tongue-tied yesterday. Um, so when you have like a teaspoon of sugar and you put it in water, all the individual sugar molecules will separate. That's dissolving. The, um, the hydroxyl will be attracted to the hydrogen in the water, and the entire C6H12O6 will stick together but separate from other C6H12O6, and that's dissolving. If this was dis disassociating, all of these individual atoms would fall apart, and covalent bonds don't disassociate. Only ionic bonds do. Um, so that was definitely something that I had to clarify when I was speaking yesterday. Um, so they can f be used for structural components as well, uh, mostly their immediate energy sources. The disaccharides also dissolve easily in water, but that means that disaccharide sticks together, separates from other disaccharides, okay? Sucrose, lactose, and maltose. If you've ever had a malted milk that has maltose in it. Last year, a lot of kids hadn't ever had a malt, so we brought in some malt and we made um, ice cream shakes with malts. 
Um, so sucrose is the most plentiful sugar in nature, and that would be because it's a plant sugar. Um, we wanna know that we circulate glucose in our blood when we get into the endocrine system at the end of the year. We'll talk about um, the feedback loop with glucose and glycogen. So we're constantly measuring our blood sugar levels and altering um, our sugar to keep it at a certain level. Other organisms circulate a disaccharide. So that's kind of interesting that not all animals are circulating the same blood glucose. Oligosaccharide, that's the one that is just a few and it's found in cell membranes used for cell to cell recognition. I've seen lots of questions in the AP world on cell membrane structure and the mosaic, right? All those different components and what form do they roll? What role do they take? Sorry. Um, so you would wanna know about the oligosaccharides in the cell membrane. And this would be part of cell signaling, cell to cell recognition. So here's our oligosaccharides, these things that are sticking up looking like antennas. Guess I have an arrow for that. Um, so this is a review of your dehydration synthesis. This was in the organic molecules um, lecture. Dehydration, you're taking out water, right? If you're dehydrated, <laughs> you're thirsty, you need water. Um, another name for this is condensation. So sometimes um, the AP will use both of these terms or it'll use one or the other. So you always wanna be familiar with alternate language. Um, and if you see both of them, read carefully through all your choices. A lot of times people will say de dehydration synthesis and answer it right away. But if they keep reading, they find A and B are choices, something like that. Um, so here you see the hydroxyl on the first carbon and the hydrogen on the one, two, three, fourth carbon. So this is taking place between the one prime and four prime carbons. Hydroxyl of one, hydrogen of the other are removed and that releases our water. So it forms what's called a glycosidic linkage. So each of these macromolecules make covalent bonds, but the name of the covalent bond is different depending on our macromolecule. So with carbohydrates, we have glycosidic linkage. Dehydration, you're taking water out, synthesis while putting things together, building it up, making it bigger. So this is showing you, this is making the connection that we need enzymes for every chemical reaction in our body. There's an enzyme that has a specific shape that fits that one prime and four prime carbons one prime and four prime carbons. Um, and the hydroxyl will fit in to the active site and the hydrogen fits into the active site. There's a conformational change that refers to shape, when you say conformation, there's a conformational change that brings them in close orientation so they're more likely to form a bond. So making connections to enzymes, you've talked about enzymes before, we're gonna hit more details about them this year. Um, so, of course, that requires energy and it requires enzymes. So metabolism itself requires energy to make energy or energy to release energy. So kind of interesting. Um, so that's our dehydration synthesis. This is our glycosidic linkage, just naming the, the bond itself. Here I have a cis bond. Notice both hydrogens are facing in the upward position in this case on the one and four prime. This is called a trans bond. This is organic chemistry. Notice in this case, the one prime is up, the four prime is down. So I think of traversing a slope and that just helps me remember trans. So they're, you know, if you were going down a hill and traversing, you'd go kind of diagonally down. Um, so this allows for different properties. So this is the alpha linkage and this is the beta linkage. So when we refer to alpha glucose and beta glucose, it's really just referring to the position of that first prime hydrogen. So if it's up, it's alpha. If it's down, it's beta. Any questions so far? Okay. 
Um, so the opposite of that is hydrolysis, breaking molecules apart, we're adding water. So hydro water lysis is to break apart. So that word literally is breaking apart with water. Um, so here we're gonna take our water and split it into hydroxyls and hydrogen. And basically it's the reverse of the dehydration synthesis. So the hydrogen of one goes on the four prime, the hydroxyl of the other goes on the one prime. You don't have to be that specific talking about one prime and four prime, I'm just using it. So you start getting used to the language of naming carbons. Okay, um, so just making connection to other things. We've talked about organelles, lysosomes in our cells, right? They break down um, molecules. It's like the digestive component of the cell, kind of like the stomach of a cell. So that's just making like connections with other places you've heard the word lyse. Um, when a cell ruptures, a cell lyses. So um, we'll talk about cytolysis, the bursting of a cell. Um, we'll talk about this with um, viruses, the lytic and the lytic, um, the lysis of, of the cell. Okay, so hydrolysis is breaking with water. So the polysaccharides, this is when alpha and beta come into play. The alpha form is good for storage. That long chain of molecules creates um, a good storage for energy. Cellulose and chitin both have beta linkages, so that was the trans, the up and down, which makes them better for pleating, creating structure. So this is easy to break these molecules. This crooked um, bond basically is not as easy to break. So this is gonna be used for structure. Cellulose is found in the cell walls of plants as well as algae, and algae is considered a protist. Um, chitin is found in the cell walls of fungi. Those are your mushrooms. Also exoskeletons of arthropods like the crickets I feed the geckos and some of the hard body parts of animals. So we're not gonna break down the cellulose and the chitin, um, but we can break down starch and glycogen. So this gets into the idea of isomers. I'm, I think you've talked about isomers in chemistry, am I right? Or no, is that an organic chemistry term? Isomers going once? Okay, thank you. Um, so isomers are basically the same chemical formula, but they have different structural formulas. So you, you can have more than one C6H12O6. They have different structures. And that's showing you here are isomers of the glucose. And I, we already talked about the alpha and the beta being the position of that hydrogen. So the hydroxyl, um, will be in the down position or the up position. And our, um, like our enzymes fit a specific isomer. Our bodies use a specific isomer. Um, so like if you have a right-handed version and a left-handed version, um, if you have the wrong version, it can create um, like birth defects because our body doesn't we don't have the enzymes to work with that version. Um, so cellulose, most abundant um, organic molecule on earth, which is why we can say carbohydrates in general is the most abundant um, on earth. Herbivores, we know, eat and digest cellulose. Most carnivores do not. We cannot digest cellulose. So we eat meat. Um, cellulose becomes part of our dietary fiber. This is showing you that trans, that up and down bond of the beta glucose. Um, and you can see this makes for a packing, so it's better for structure. So um, we can use digestion as another term for um, breaking apart a molecule. So we talked about hydrolysis. Another term for that is digestion. And we kind of already talked about breaking the bond there with water and releasing energy. So that's another version of hydrolysis, probably didn't need that one. Um, this is showing you the bonds that we can digest, and these are bonds that we can't. 
So remember our enzymes have specific shapes, substrate, active site. Um, so this substrate would fit in the active site, but this substrate would not, right? So we can't digest the trans version, but we can digest the alpha version. Um, so this is our glycogen or our starch. This is your cellulose or chitin. So animals that can digest plants, um, they have a symbiotic relationship. It's going to be on the next slide um, with bacteria that allow them to do that. So like a cow is what's called a ruminant organism. They have more than one stomach. And they can digest cellulose only because of the bacteria that live within them. Gorillas cannot. So they have to add other food to their diet in order to be able to push that cellulose along. So it's really important that we know about this in this uh, symbi symbiotic relationship between bacteria and the cows. So it's not the cow digesting the cellulose, it's the bacteria that digests the cellulose. Cows are what are called ruminant organisms. They have more than one stomach. So you can see um, they have more than one stomach. Following the food, the green goes into this first stomach and then he actually regurgitates it. And when it's regurgitated, it then goes into the second stomach and that's where the bacteria live that break down the, the cellulose. So here we're just mechanically breaking them the apart into smaller pieces and then they re-swallow and then that's when they get broken down into their smallest of pieces. You'll see that on ones that I used for videos. Um, so carbohydrates, we want to know structure and function. And there we really got into how the structure alpha or beta determines its function, energy or, or structural component. Um, you want to know how your bodies are using the elements that make up these macromolecules. So we already talked about carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. You want to know about the polarities of those functional groups. So we know that um, hydroxyl makes carbohydrates very polar, so they can dissolve in water. And of your functional groups, if this helps you, the only one that's not polar is methyl. All your other functional groups were polar, and therefore um, they dissolve in water. And then the methyl group doesn't, which is why lipids don't, because they're basically just long chains of hydrocarbons. And so the methyl is the only nonpolar. So what questions do you have for me? We're gonna jump into, um, we're gonna jump into um, the breakout rooms. If you could open your AP classroom, I think I have four questions. This time I did not give you an FRQ. They're all multiple choice, I believe. I hope, <laughs> I'll double check. Okay, so I'm gonna stop my screen share. You guys are opening, um, I put you a link in the Google Classroom for the AP um, Classroom, it should have four questions. So if somebody wants to share the screen, it makes it easier for you to have a conversation about each of the topics. So talk about the questions, talking about it helps you internalize the information. If you're explaining it to someone, you're gonna remember it a whole lot more than if you're just like quizzing yourself, okay? So you're gonna get an invite to the breakout. Okay, I know you guys wanna get going. I'm just gonna go through this part. Um, so in the first question about the rabbits, carbon necessary for building biological molecules, they break down molecules to obtain the carbon and other atoms, and then they rearrange, you can use, use the words assimilate, um, into new carbon-containing molecules. So we know that they're gonna take the grass that they're eating, break it down and create carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, nucleic acids from those carbons. And this one, um, this is about the nitrogen and where does nitrogen go? And um, that was in today's topic, but it was in identifying macromolecules yesterday. So we know that nitrogen is in proteins and nucleic acids. So the ammonia, um, NH3, is gonna be broken down and then we'll use the nitrogen to assimilate proteins and nucleic acids. Number three, um, what are we asking? The observed difference, of, which of the following? 
I'd have to read that a little bit more. Um, so we should have had this one, which is our amine group. And this is our nucleic acid, right? So nitrogen is in both. And then the last one, these are all isomers of C6H12O6. Um, so they have different structural formula, formulas, same chemical formula. So the position of the carbonyl group is different or the position of the hydroxyl on the fourth carbon is different. So the carbohydrates have different properties because they have different arrangements of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms. So the isomers, the position of the carbonyl, the position of the hydroxyl will fit uh, different, it'll interact with chemicals differently. Um, so they have different jobs. Okay, any questions on those four questions that we did this week? Um, I don't understand number three still. Okay, I need to read it. Sorry. Um, students, so this one grew well. This one did not grow well. The leaves have dark green. These ones have grayish. Um, so dark green seemed to be good. The observed differences between the groups may likely resulted from differences in the ability of ceilings to reduce risk. All right, so um, we need to make DNA. DNA codes for all of our cells and their components. And then protein is our structure, like it's, it's the building component of cells and, and um, tissues. So you would, in order to grow, you would need nucleic acids to give the directions and you would need proteins to create the structure. So maybe we didn't have enough information yet to answer this question because we haven't talked in detail about nucleic acids and proteins. So that one was not fair. So I just packed a whole bunch of things into um, your flex time Google space. Um, you have a video to watch. You have books to read, notes to take, worksheets, workbooks. Um, that's all, you know, maybe you don't get it all done today. We have until Monday. That's part of that. We need to do a little bit each day. So you guys should be doing a video each day, whether we're in class or not. Um, you should be reading your book along the way whenever we're talking about topics. Um, taking notes is all part of learning, right? You're usually, when you read, you take notes. So that's, that's not something that I'm going to necessarily look for for a grade, but it's something you should be doing on your own. Um, so I just put all those things in there as a reminder. I will be scoring those bio zones that come in, however. And that's the only thing that I'm expecting you to turn in right now.